Embedded in the flatlands of Kansas, Arrowhead Stadium stands as a monument to the rich history of the Kansas City Chiefs. Filled to the brim with 80,000 diehards and oozing with pump, the stadium was ready for the Chiefs' revenge game with the Miami Dolphins. For nine months, the Chiefs had simmered over their loss to the Dolphins in pro football's longest game. Now, vengeance was theirs. But the Dolphins were ready and dealt out much punishment. Even young, untested Vern Den Herder, number 83, fought through the red to pick Lenny Dawson's 37-year-old pocket. The Dolphins' collapsible zone twice plucked passes from the hands of Kansas City receivers, and vengeance was theirs. On the ground, Miami was led by the unmatched triumvirate of Mercury Morris, Jim Kick, number 21, and Larry Zonka, number 39, whose demolition derby burst accounted for over 100 yards. Finally, heady Bob Greasy rolled right and tossed a touchdown to recently acquired Marlon Briscoe. The touchdown resulted from perfect blocking. Watch number 81, Marv Upshaw, as he is ridden out of the play, allowing Greasy a perfect sightline to Briscoe in the end zone. By halftime, a 17-0 Miami lead and 100-degree temperatures had drained the dispirited Chiefs. Their frustration can be summed up with the pent-up rage of receiver Otis Taylor, number 89. When he missed a block, the sweep was swamped in a wave of white. Even his graceful antelope strides carried him not to touchdown's door, but to a clumsy rendezvous with his teammates. And with empty slogans drooping in the stands, Otis Taylor, superstar, was thrown out of the game. Only once did Kansas City score a touchdown, but it was a hollow six points in the final seconds as the ingrate Dolphins busted up the housewarming 20-10. The wind whipped up a gale in Miami's Orange Bowl, and the normally mistake-proof Dolphins started off looking like a carnival act. But soggy poly turf does not discriminate. The Houston Oilers matched Miami in madness for a total of eight fumbles. That's all the Oilers could match them in as Miami had all the horses when they held on to the ball. Quarter horse Jim Kick bucked to the one to set up his own touchdown. And an even faster pony, Mercury Morris, number 22, raced up and down the slippery mat for 94 total yards. Miami even had a reserve thoroughbred in the stable as third string running back Hubert Ginn, number 32, added to Miami's 450 yards on total offense. Meanwhile, the Oilers kept coming out second best in their struggle with the wet rug.
Houston kept right on stumbling and coughing up the ball, and Bob Greasy and the Dolphins scored often and early, en route to a commanding 27 to nothing lead. The Oiler offense now consisted of number seven, Dan Pastorini scrambling for anything he could get. Pastorini's long day finally brightened a bit as he ferreted out Charlie Joyner for an 82-yard consolation prize. But Miami simply had too much horsepower as the Dolphins overcame the elements in the Houston Oilers for a 34-13 victory. In Minnesota, the Viking fans practiced the happy art of tailgating royally. But quiche in costumes is strictly an hors d'oeuvre for these gourmets. And the main course, filet of greasy dolphin, was yet to be served. On his first series, Fran Tarkenton hit with the old persimmon pass, drawing in the Dolphin defense and hitting John Gilliam all alone for a 56-yard catch and carry touchdown. Meanwhile, the Purple Gang put the zonk on the Miami attack. Number 60, Roy Winston doing the honors here. After Dick the Stick Anderson stole the ball from Minnesota's Bill Brown, Greasy frittered away Miami's only scoring chance in the first half with this interception by number 20, Bobby Bryant. Late in the third period, number 32, Oscar Reed's 22-yard sweep sparked an 80-yard 13-play touchdown drive. With fourth and a half yard to go, Bill Brown dove across, establishing the Vikings lead at 14 to six. Employing a little razzle-dazzle to overcome penalties, Marlon Briscoe pass complete to Jim Mandich, setting up Garrow Upremian's third field goal, a 51-yarder. Upremian's boot ended almost 10 minutes of Miami ball control in the fourth period. And now the no-name defense had to face down the Tarkenton mob. With 2.11 left, Miami regained the ball, aided by a roughing penalty on Bob Lertzema. An unrushed Bob Greasy found Howard Twilley for 17 more yards in the throat of the Vikings zone. On the next play, Bob Greasy hit Jim Mandich for a touchdown, making Don Shula the only undefeated coach in the NFL, defeating the Vikings 16 to 14. Sundays in New York can be a pleasant time especially if you're among the Shea Stadium faithful who come to see another exciting chapter in the saga of the man with the eggshell knees. The man, of course, is Joe Namath. As he goes, so go the Jets. Facing the man last week was the machine, an awesome powerhouse built by head coach Don Shula. From a joke to challenger to the team to beat in just three years, Shula built his machine in a series of interchangeable parts. These parts have meshed to make Miami the only undefeated team in the NFL this season. 
The man went after the machine early by picking away at the underneath coverage in the Miami zone. Namath controlled Miami with a carefully measured 13-play drive, which culminated in a one-yard touchdown to give the Jets an early 7-0 lead. but the machine and its component parts purr with efficiency. Once in a while, graceful Paul Warfield, number 42, is not absolutely perfect. But the Dolphins do not depend on only one man. Shula can pluck a spare part like Howard Twilley from the bench and never miss a beat. Twilly's touchdown catch put Miami on the board, but it's the heavy-duty flywheels at the heart of that machine that really makes it unstoppable. Iron Man Larry Zonka ripped through the Jets for 102 yards. And twin piston Jimmy Kick blasted in for two touchdowns to give Miami a commanding lead. But you know you can never count the man out. Jerome Barkham was ruled down on the six-inch line where it was first and goal. There was a time when a touchdown from inches was a foregone conclusion against the Dolphin defense, but this series demonstrated how far Shula has brought his team. They rose up to stop New York three straight times. Namath even gave it a crack, but the Jets had to settle for a field goal. New York was still in the ballpark with Miami ahead 27-17, but the potential Namath fourth quarter rally never came off. In the end, it was machine over man. As Joe Namath goes, so go the Jets. Namath went down this time, but he will be back to try it again in Miami next month. Today, Don Shula's component parts were too much as Miami remained undefeated and moved two full games ahead in the AFC East. Weeb Eubank and the rest of the coaches in the division can only hold on and hope now for a breakdown. In Florida, the Miami fans love and emulate their Dolphins. And last Sunday, they packed the Orange Bowl 80,000 strong to watch their team go for its fifth win in a row. While the Dolphins are number one in Miami, they're also number one in all of pro football as they are the only undefeated team left. Their success has been due in great measure to quarterback Bob Greasy, who last week against the Chargers came out firing. But early in the first quarter, Greasy suffered a possible season-ending injury when his leg was broken and his ankle dislocated. When it happened, Coach Don Shula said, the mark of a good team is how it performs in adversity. And there can be no greater adversity than having your quarterback laid out there in front of you. In adversity, the Miami defense was superb as they manhandled the Chargers' John Hadle. In adversity, the defense was alert as Dick Anderson, number 40, grabbed a fumble and took it 35 yards for a score.
in adversity, the Dolphin defense stopped everything the Chargers threw at them. But while the defense was great, the Miami offense was fantastic. The offensive line gave Earl Marl, number 15, just about all day to throw, although at first he was a little rusty. But behind the perfect blocking protection of Larry Little and company, Earl spun a beauty to Howard Twilley, and in adversity, the Dolphins' offense came through. But Earl wasn't through, and standing ramrod straight in a cast iron passing pocket, he zipped another score to Paul Warfield, which gave Miami a 24-3 lead. With the game out of reach, John Hadle hit Sid Edwards for a Charger touchdown. But when Hadle got ideas of putting San Diego back in the game, the Miami defense in the person of number 13, Jake Scott, vetoed the motion. There's no question that Miami will miss Bob Greasy a great deal. But as San Diego learned, the Dolphins are a very tough bunch when placed in an adverse situation. Game number six brought Buffalo. And with Greasy on the sidelines, the Dolphin defense took charge of the game. O.J. Simpson was held to 13 yards rushing in the first half. And in the second, Manny Fernandez stole a handoff and the ball game as Miami squeezed past the Bills by a single point. It's been three years since Don Shula left Baltimore to lead Miami into battle, and in those three years, much has changed. The once woeful Dolphins are now football's finest. The once proud Colts are now struggling for respectability. Last week, Shula returned home and controlled his former team with his unstoppable ground game. Indestructible Larry Zonka finished off a ball control drive from the one, then the Dolphins added a new wrinkle. The flanker pass was a natural for ex-quarterback Marlon Briscoe, number 86. Paul Warfield's catch set up another short Zonka touchdown. But Miami's true strength lies in its concept of team. 40 men with 40 different talents, each finding a way to win. Number 32, Hubert Ginn scored for the Miami Bomb Squatters. But officials ruled the ball dead at point of recovery. And so the unfazed Dolphins merely called on yet another facet of total team. Super quick Mercury Morris put the Dolphins up by 23. As far as the sagging cold offense was concerned, it might as well have been 100. With the season only half over, the Colts are already rebuilding for next year with rugged Marty Domries, number 14, a promising young quarterback with much still to learn. In three years, two teams have passed in the night, going opposite directions. With their 23-0 win, the Dolphins now stand 7-0. Baltimore, unbelievably, is 1-6. This is Miami coach Don Shula, a man who is bidding to become the first ever to lead a team to victory in every game of its season. And coach Shula is making his bid without his ace of Trump, the injured Bob Greasy. 
Replacing Greasy at quarterback is the wily veteran Earl Morrill. But last Sunday in Buffalo, the wily veteran had the Dolphins going nowhere early in the game. The Bills, who have come closer to beating the Dolphins than anyone else has this year, struck early as number 43 Tony Green stole a pass and sped in for six. O.J. Simpson added sparkle and yardage to the stampeding Buffalo attack. Dennis Shaw's pass to number 33 Randy Jackson kept the Bills close and had the Dolphins so worried that they were forced to unleash the weapons. One weapon, of course, goes by the code name Mercury, wears number 22 and is pure devastation. Another Miami weapon is codenamed Zock, wears number 39 in his pure destruction. And so Mercury and Zonk chewed up yardage and got the Dolphins in close enough for Earl Morrill to thread the needle to number 80, Marv Fleming. Not wanting to miss out on the fun, the Dolphin defense descended on Dennis Shaw with malice as well as bad intentions. When they didn't sack Shaw, they rushed his throws and the secondary snapped them up. In the end, the Bills weren't even close as Mercury motored in for the Dolphins' eighth win in a row, 30 to 16. What can you say about four pretty girls who enjoy watching a slaughter? What can you say about a young quarterback who has lost his offensive line and knows not where to find them? What can you say about the Miami Dolphins that hasn't been said? They are fantastic, they are awesome, and they are unstoppable. And that's a pretty fair description of their star runner, number 22, Mercury Morris, who started the rout of the Patriots with a triumvirate of easy touchdowns. The rest of the Dolphins chipped in by running stupendous plays on top of amazing plays.
Earl Morrill and number 86 Marlon Briscoe chipped in with the Dolphins' 38th point. Then number 11 Jim Del Gazo and Marlon Briscoe chipped in with the finest play of the game, a 51-yard touchdown. Del Gazo then zipped one to Jim Mandich to round out the biggest margin of victory in the NFL so far this year. For fantastic Don Shula, it's been 100 victories in his first 10 years, and he's the first ever to do that. For Patriots coach John Mazur, it was his last loss with the Patriots, but he probably won't be the last to do that. Nothing attests more to the strength of the Miami Dolphins than the fact that this man, Bob Greasy, has been sidelined most of the season. Yet the Dolphins continue to be undefeated. Greasy's broken leg has introduced a new Dolphin hero, but an old Orange Bowl face, Earl Morrill. The 38-year-old quarterback has done so well that going into last Sunday's game, Miami had the opportunity to be the first team this year to clinch a division title. A victory over the Jets would accomplish this, and it is only week number 10. Greasy's injury has brought about an interesting rematch today. For in this same Orange Bowl in 1969, Earl Morrill, then a Colt, was the victim of Joe Namath's guaranteed Super Bowl upset. Today, as four years ago, the pressure is on Namath and New York, for the Jets must duel for their very lives. The Eastern Division title is all but beyond their reach, but they still can squeeze into the playoffs as the wild card in the AFC. So this is a big one for both teams as the Miami Dolphins tried to clinch its title and run the unbeaten streak to 10 games in a bid to attain the first unbeaten season since the Cleveland Browns did it 24 years ago. Well, the New York Jets, led by Joe Namath, today is a fight for survival. This for an upset looked dim indeed when on their first series of the game from deep in his own territory, Namath's pass was intercepted by Dick Anderson, number 40. With the game barely a minute old, the Dolphins had already made a big break in this important ball game. This is the kind of play Miami has been getting all season from the no-name defense. Several plays later, Earl Morrill hit Howard Twilley, slanting in the end zone, and Miami was on the boards first, seven to nothing. Again, it was Howard Twilley who made the big play for six points. This is the little guy who every summer camp loses his job to faster men. But when the season begins, Howard Twilley somehow finds his way into the lineup. This year, such talented receivers as young Otto Stowe and Marlon Briscoe, who Miami obtained in a big trade, are sitting on the bench watching the tough Twilley star. Another look at that score from our end zone camera shows Twilley barely held onto the ball as he drew first blood from number 21 Steve Tannen in what would be a classic duel between the little receiver and the cornerback all day long. All game. But once again, the Dolphin defense came through in magnificent fashion. When Manny Fernandez batted down Namath's third down pass, Bobby Halfield was called on and successfully kicked the field goal that brought the score to 17 to seven. Unsurprisingly, Howard Twilley got them started on a 22 yard slant between Tannen and Hicks. Then one play later, Earl Morrill cranked up his 38 year old arm and let it fly. Again, Twilley had badly beaten Tannen. Though he was out at the one, the little guy had again proved to be the big gun. In Paul Warfield's absence because of an injured ankle, it was vital that someone take up the slack, and today Howard Twilley was the man that got it done. From the one, the call went to Larry Zaka, who was crunched in midair and lost the ball for the first time since the Super Bowl. But Miami guard Bob Kuchenberg recovered.
Miami had another crack at it, and Mercury Morris flew over Zonka's block into the end zone for the touchdown. The Orange Bowl's huge crowd reached for their hankies in their now traditional salute, for their team had come roaring back. So in the second half, after an exchange of punts, Earl Morrill turned to another runner, and the 38-year-old legs of Earl Morrill showed remarkable quickness as he ran 31 yards to put Miami back on top. It's ironic that Morrill would score on such a scramble, for when he took over for scrambler extraordinaire Bob Greasy, that element was supposed to be lacking, and an immobile quarterback was a possible chink in the Dolphin armor. Also ironic is that with runners like Zonka, Morris, and Kick, Morrill's 31-yard run was the longest Dolphin run from scrimmage this season. Three with plenty of time left, Earl Morrill went with Miami's strength, the run. Watch all pro guard Larry Little, number 66, wipe out Phil Wise, number 27, to spring Zonka loose for 18 yards. With the ball at midfield and the Jets looking for the run, Earl Morrill hit Otto Stowe, who made a nice catch despite early Thomas's close, close coverage. But that was the extent of the drive as Cliff McLean went into the line with the ball, but emerged without it. Dick Anderson, whose interception set up Miami's first score, made the recovery to set up their last. With the Dolphin line sealing off jet pursuit coming from the left, Morris went 14 yards for the touchdown. On the run, Mercury Morris showed he has more than just speed and moves as he powered over Phil Wise to get the score. For the fifth time, the lead had changed hands as Miami now led 28 to 14. And repeating the play reveals why Miami had taken the lead. Set up by the defense, the Dolphin line had created a hole for one of their tough backs. Watch number 67, Bob Kuchenberg, bump number 60, Larry Grantham, giving Morris the only hole he needs to show his moves and that power. The touchdown was Morris's fifth in the last two games, and he has asserted himself as a starter and has broken up the Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid tandem having forced Jimmy kick to the sidelines with his performance this season. Ground time off the clock. With Mercury Morris gaining 88 yards in the second half, he went over the century mark. But the Dolphins couldn't run off all the time before bringing a first down and keeping the Miami drive alive. Like every punter, Seipel has developed a first-class dying swan routine to draw penalties, but this time Seipel was really hurt having strained his knee and illustrates why the roughing the kicker penalty is a real safeguard in pro football. A punter is highly vulnerable to injury until well after he's landed, after he makes the punt. Though Seipel had paid with pain, the penalty enabled the Miami to keep the ball. And relying mostly on Morris, they were able to run off most of the remaining time. Though the Dolphins did not completely run out the clock, they forced the Jets to use all their timeouts. So that when Dick Anderson, standing in for Seifel, punted, 
The Jets got the ball in their own nine with no timeouts remaining and little time left. Though they got off four plays, the Jets could not score against the Dolphins' prevent defense. And Miami had the victory. Don Shula's 101st victory in just 10 years of head coaching was the Dolphins' 10th straight win in 1972. After only 10 weeks, the Dolphins, still undefeated, had clinched the AFC Eastern Division title. The first step in what looks like a return to the Super Bowl. Offensive wide receivers, 84 is Walker Gillette, and this is the pass to Quazzo to Gillette, he fumbles the ball. Well, Tim Foley had the ball once, did it get away? It did, and it's picked up by Dick Anderson, number 40. What a money player that Dick Anderson is. He's got a nose for the football. Morris again, here comes Kuchenberg, number 67, with the block. And look at him go. Out of bounds at the 25 and a half yard mark goes Mercury Morris. Ed Thompson, out to the right goes Howard Quilly, picked up by Miller Farr. The tight end is on the left side. All the way down to the eight yard line goes Howard Quilly. It stays in with Zonka and kick with a fine block, springs Zonka around to the five and down to the four. Zonka straight ahead following Jim Langer, Larry Little, and Bob Kuchenberg. The middle of the offensive line for the Dolphins. 88, Mark Fleming, number 80. This is the veteran Earl Morrill. He gives it to kick. He gives it a kick right behind Zonka. But uh, Shula wanted the wide running threat. Look at this. Little leads out. What's Zonka's block? Number 39. He kicks this, lowers his head. He gets number... 43, Norm Thompson takes him on in with him. This is a... The Miami Dolphins lead the St. Louis Cardinals 7 to nothing on a beautiful night for football from the Orange Bowl in Miami, where we'll be back right after this message. First and 10 from the 20. Both backs coming out of the backfield. This is Frisco. Nailed there by Larry Stalling, 67. We get into that one in a little while. On second down and two, and oh, big hole. Jim Kick. Look at old Sundance go. Kick with about a yard gain. The screen goes to Briscoe, and he can throw it also. That's three for three, boys. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a pretty play. I like it. That's fun. Not right about Briscoe being able to throw. He played quarterback, as most of you know, in the in the American Football League. The man out of Michigan, replacing Mar Fleming. In there. Briscoe. Marlon Briscoe, he's got the first down, he's inside the 15. He ought to have about a while ago, this guy does have a lot of speed. 14 of 24 overall, 15 of 25. You can almost say it's automatic when it's inside the 30 for Carol Yepremian. As the Dolphins extend their lead over the Cardinals to 10 to 3. Moore, top of your screen, now coming in motion. And uh, now Quazzo trips. Well, now, if he trips over his foot, it's going to be like father, like son there. They're at the eight-yard line. Donnie Anderson fumbles, and this time it's kicked off by Stanfield. I tell you. Well, it's not going to really turn it around right there. If they could have brought that one in there, we could have been in a big upset. Let's see. I didn't see Donnie get hit. He's got the ball. He never did get a good exchange from Quazzo. Looks like he reached for it a little bit. That's Stanfield, number 84, who picks it up. He can advance it. And he almost fumbled. Much tonight, Don. I don't really know. Oh, that was in there. Frisco holds on. And man, what a lick. Oh, he took I, a I shot. Roger Worley may be down on that one because he took a heck of a lick from Frisco. Morrow finds kick. That's why he's in there. Kick, first down, up to the 44-yard line. Green, ball at the 44, and here comes Zonka. 237 pounds, and look at him, motor. Oh, oh, oh. That's the ticket, the two of them together. Second down and nine. Kick out of the backfield again. Moore with time to throw. He's going to for Stowe, wide open. Otto Stowe. This man has put on some kind of performance tonight. He, how did he get that deep? Well, 
The Dolphins lead the Cardinals 17-3, 9.54 remaining in the third quarter. They trail 17-3. Mel Gray motions left. And Gary Fazzo having bunion problems again. Bonacani is out third down to nine from the 47. This is Johnson, Curtis Johnson. He just wasn't open. You can't force it in there like that, Don. He's in a setback. Hart. Yep, there you go. Well, Lloyd Mumford. He's going to score. Oh, that, I really hate to see that for Jim Hart, but the fans here in Miami are really happy. That may be, but that's Don Shula for you. He just put Mumford in there, number 26. The kind of night they're having tonight. Jim gets pretty good protection here, as you see. That ball is just overthrown. It goes to Smith. He can't reach it. And here's Mumford coming up from his deep. Actually, I think he was at the quarterback. I mean, the safety in there. And Howard mentioned it's kind of an unusual defense. But you can see the guys rallying in there to get out in front of him. That's Mike Cohen, number 57, is in front. He's going to block on the heart. And Morrill, I think, anticipating the snap a little early. And here goes the other one. Bonka. Look at him run. Well, that was a funny looking play. It looked like everybody was just kind of standing around there. Zonka was the only one that was moving. Hey. Six man again, number 39. Zonka rolls over the 50. The Dolphins have broken it over, broken it open in the third quarter. Look how quick Mercury Morris is. He really is. Here comes a couple more flags. Yep. That's probably a. Uh, face guard or something like that. Whatever it was, they didn't like it down there. They put him off the field by himself, and they said, that Mark came back with the biggest sack of kill these you ever saw in your life. <laughs> Thought he'd been shooting doves. It's a face mask, obviously, and let's take another look at it. You saw Mercury Mars make his reaction when he saw Don Brum, number 86, go up field there. Picked up a good one right here, and let's see, there's, you can see it pretty good. There's that face mask. <laughs> Old Dale says you got to get them to any way you can. He's short of the 39-yard line of the Cardinals. Morrill almost trips again. Gets the screen to Mercury Morris. Morris inside the 30. Uh, fine walking out in front. Very quick. Let's see, Earl. You. He's coming back again. Flips it right over a little screen pass to Morris. Now watch him out that ball. He's got a loaf of bread in his hand. And then he puts it away. Gets everything he can. What a new dimension Morris adds to the Dolphins. They still have kick to come back with. But picks up the first down at the 28-yard mark. Here comes Larry Wilson. The safety blitz is picked up. It could be oh, six. He is so wide open. That's what happens when you pick up the safety blitz. Auto Stone gets the second touchdown. See the youngster? All right, here's Zonka. I believe he's the one that picks up Larry Wilson, number eight. Earl has plenty of time to throw, and I'm telling you, Otto Stowe is all alone. O. Thompson's having his trouble tonight. So the Miami Dolphins extend their lead, 31-10, over the St. Louis Cardinals. Oh, lost the football. Miami recovers. 3-43, clock moving. New quarterback is in the game, and this is Jim Delgazo. Out of Tampa, University. Team got into the 60s. But that is a club scoring record. Okay, on the third and short yardage, and look at the big man ball. There is Oscar. What can you say? He just runs over people. From the 33 yard line on first and 10, the Dolphins. This is Ginn, Hubert Ginn. The ball resting at the 28-yard line of the Cardinals. Jim Delgazio. And you can't throw him much better than that. Boy, he drilled that time. Oh, oh. catch him much better. That auto snow is some kind of receiver. And this is some kind of football team. We'll be back at the Orange Bowl right after this message. It has not been a bang-up year for the New England Patriots. Last week, they were facing the Miami Dolphins, which only made matters worse. 
For New England quarterback Jim Plunkett, it has been a bang-up year, and he's been banged up and knocked down many, many times. Last week, Larry Zonka, number 39, was bullying his way for huge gains as usual, and although he fumbled at the end of this play, the whistle had blown. However, the Dolphins had to settle for a field goal. Back throughout the first half, the Patriot defense almost stymied the Miami attack. Number 29, Honor Jackson, made a great interception and returned to end one Dolphin drive. Just before the half, Plunkett unleashed a long pass that number 21 Tom Reynolds turned into a super score. The Patriots trailed by only 13-7. But in the third period, Miami unloaded as number 83, Vern Den Herder, intercepted to put the Dolphins in good shape. Earl Morrill hit number 88, Jim Mandich, and the route was on. Marl to Marlon Briscoe made it 30 to 7, and it was time to clear the Miami bench. Number 32, Hubert Ginn put the Dolphins up 37-7, and made one wonder if there's any end to those Miami runners. In the subs versus subs game, number 14, Brian Dowling hit number 36, John Tarver, for one New England tally. Later, a pass from Jim Delgazo was picked off by Honor Jackson to set up a Brian Dowling one-yard score. And although the Patriot subs outscored the Patriot regulars, no one outscores the Miami Dolphins, who are now looking for 13 straight. With Bob Greasy back in uniform, the Miami Dolphins went after Lucky 13 in New York, hoping they wouldn't need him. But victory number 13 didn't start out too well, as Norm Sneed's pass to Don Herman put the Giants on the Miami 1 from where Ron Johnson took it in. The extra point was blocked, and New York led 6-0. The wing feet of Mercury Morris quickly put things in their proper perspective. Sneed to number 38, tight end Bob Tucker, a rugged performer all season, put the Giants in close, but they fumbled on the next play to kill the drive. The game then became a punch-it-out infantry battle with number 21, Jim Kick, leading the Dolphins. The Giants countered with number 29, Vince Clements, who has come into his own in the latter part of the season. Number 30, Ron Johnson, the Giants' 1,000-yard rusher, crashed in to give New York the lead. But Earl Morrill to Paul Warfield proved a deadly poison, and the Giants could find no antidote. 
combined with three Garo Premium field goals, the Marl to Warfield combo gave the Dolphins enough point power for a 23 13 victory. The nice thing about it was that Bob Greasy didn't even have to get his cleats muddy. The Dolphin Dynasty, according to all the signs, is emerging as the top story in professional football in 1972. Through 13 weeks, the Dolphin juggernaut has rolled through the NFL undefeated, untied, highly scoring, and hardly scored upon. And now in the last week of the regular season, only the decayed Baltimore Colts stood between the Dolphins and an historic, unprecedented 14th consecutive victory. Almost mechanically, without force of emotion, the Dolphin machine went smoothly to work, eating up the few minutes remaining in the perfect season of the Miami Dolphins. Number 26, Lloyd Mumford, led this assault on the Colts' new quarterback, Marty Domres. Meanwhile, a familiar elder statesman stood by in obvious dismay. But when Domrez was overwhelmed and injured by Miami's title rush, the famed but aged quarterback John Unitas strode once again into the breach. But even this potentially dynamic situation was shortly diffused by the cool Dolphins. And in most probably his last appearance as a Baltimore Colt, Johnny Yu could direct no grand finale. And for the maestro, the moment was best forgotten. Garrow Yupremian kicked the Dolphins into the lead. And Earl Morrill hit Paul Warfield to gain a 16-0 advantage as the Dolphins did what needed to be done to secure their undefeated season. Almost symbolically, this remarkable team, having won all year on depth, showed it would be well for the playoffs when Bob Greasy replaced Earl Morrill in the fourth period. And in this, the perfect season of the Miami Dolphins, perhaps only one dream went unfulfilled. Mercury Morris could not give the Dolphins two 1,000-yard rushers in a single season. He was forced to settle for 991 yards when he left the game with an injured ankle. And if there is any ill omen for the Dolphins, it is this game ankle, an injury perhaps needlessly sustained for individual achievement at the greater expense of the team. But in this professional game, who is to deny the man and the crowd the perfect thrill of excellence? Certainly not Don Shula, the author of the Dolphin Dynasty and the man most responsible for this most perfect season. Cleveland's very first play from scrimmage served to show young Phipps what he had to overcome all day as his first pass was tipped by two players and then intercepted. Or was it? Whether or not linebacker Doug Swift intercepted or trapped the ball had no bearing on the outcome as Cleveland held Miami scoreless until this play midway through the first quarter. In super slow motion, we can see number 49, rookie Charlie Babb, pour through untouched to block Don Cockroft's punt. Babb recovered the ball himself at the five, and then was escorted by an honor guard of Dolphins into the end zone for the first score of the game.
This touchdown was important because both clubs agreed that if Miami scored first, a Cleveland comeback would be nearly impossible considering the Dolphins' record-breaking ground game, which was capable of controlling a game on the ground. the Miami 25. Phipps passed right into the arms of Curtis Johnson to end a fine Cleveland drive. This was only one of five interceptions Miami's famed no-name defense would get today. Prior to the game, experts had said that Cleveland needed to play a perfect, errorless game to have any chance of beating the Dolphins. But there was still eight minutes to go, and Miami, led by Paul Warfield, had it when they needed it most. After the former Brown took a pass between two defenders and survived a high-low tackle, Warfield got a step on defender Ben Davis and made a great catch of an overthrown pass by Earl Morrill. After an interference call on a pass intended for Warfield at the Cleveland goal line, Jim Kick atoned for an earlier fumble by crashing through the Cleveland defense for the score that put Miami ahead for good. Fittingly, the man who made the difference was Paul Warfield, for whom this game had a special meaning. He alone had accounted for 60 of the 80 yards that brought the winning touchdown. Also fittingly, it was Jim Kick who had scored it for he perhaps more than any other player symbolizes the unselfish teamwork that makes the Miami Dolphins a great team. And appropriately, the first man waiting to congratulate Kick on the sidelines was Mercury Morris, the man who took his job. Now as Cleveland coach Skoritz watched with impending doom, Cleveland put together a final effort and drove deep into Dolphin territory with less than a minute remaining. But Miami sealed the win with their fifth interception of a Mike Phipps pass. Linebacker Doug Swift second of the afternoon. The Browns and Mike Phipps had nearly pulled off the upset of the year. But in the end, Don Shula's Dolphins had their 15th consecutive victory and perhaps the renewed impetus to propel them to the Super Bowl. The Dolphins received the opening kickoff and were determined to send their 2,000-yard runners, Zonka and Morris, on the same successful journeys they have taken all year. But one of the key factors in the first half was the ability of the Steelers' defense to contain both Dolphin backs, particularly Morris. The Dolphins managed a couple of first downs, however, and on first and ten from midfield, Morrow went to the air. Terry chose to run, but Jake Scott's tackle stopped Bradshaw cold on the third down play and should have saved the score and forced a field goal. Instead, the Dolphins were down seven to nothing. But the Steelers were also down because on the play, Bradshaw had hurt his shoulder and would later leave the game for a long time. The rock-tough Bradshaw had forced his own injury by trying to bull his way in for the score. He paid the price a running quarterback must pay. Bradshaw came back in the next series, but as our isolated shot of his reaction shows, he was not effective at all and sat down for the entire second quarter. particularly effective filling the gaps.
Late in the first quarter, however, Morrill and the Dolphins' offensive line turned Zonka loose, and the team began to move. The Steelers were double zoning Warfield and Twilly, so Morrill's passing strategy centered on the tight end Marv Fleming over the middle. But after moving near midfield, L.C. Greenwood stopped Morris and the Dolphins again on three downs and forced a punt. A punt which never came to pass and ended in a run and one of the big plays of the game. Seeing no punt rush, Larry Seipel had ad-libbed his way to the 12, and from here the Steelers were zonked back into the end zone by number 39 himself with the help of all-pro guard 66, Larry Little. After running right, Morrow flipped an outlet pass to Zonka on the left side. He busted a futile attempt at a tackle by cornerback Mel Blunt and tied the game at seven. The alert play by Larry Seipel had been the big one and as Coach Shula later remarked, was the turning point of the game. The Steelers were still leading a charmed life, however, as this play will show. The play was ruled dead, not a fumble, and the Dolphins took over on a punt rather than on the Steelers' 20 after the apparent fumble. Sluggish offense on track. He replaced Earl Morrill with injury-plagued Bob Greasy. So in a highly unusual development for a championship game, both teams were forced to use substitute quarterbacks. Of course, as the Steelers well knew, Greasy is hardly a sub. Warfield, whose flying feet did the rest. The result was 52 yards and one of the big plays of this ball game. Took advantage of this new opportunity. Scrambling around in his backfield like the Greasy of old, despite the stiffness in his injured ankle, the quarterback hit his tight end, Marv Fleming, on the five-yard line. The former Packer is recognized as a great blocker, but today he burned the Steelers with five catches on his way to his fourth Super Bowl appearance. Shortly after Fleming's catch, Jim Kick took a pitch out, followed a Larry Zonka block and rammed into the end zone for the touchdown that put Miami ahead for the first time in the football game. of the final quarter, Roy Girella's attempt from midfield was blocked. The Miami defense was now dominating the game and had given the Dolphin offense great field position. <music> 
After a pass to Marv Fleming picked up a first down, Greasy turned the ball over to his ground attack. Led by Mercury Morris and Larry Zonka, the Miami machine continued to move goalward as the Steeler offense watched helplessly from the sideline. After Zonka had taken the ball to the four, Chuck Knoll sent in the shock troops to beef up Pittsburgh's defense for the goal line stand. But despite a tentative disclaiming gesture from one fan, most of the 50,350 in the stands looked on with impending doom. For surely, another seven points by Miami this late in the game would end the Steelers' chances for victory. As Miami coach Shula looked on, the Miami offense walked to the line to challenge the steel curtain where it counted most, in the shadow of their own goal line. It was no contest. For Miami, everybody blocks, and Jim Kick followed this teamwork into the end zone for his second touchdown of the day. Miami's lead was now 11 points. Then on third down, again under pressure, Bradshaw threw right into the arms of middle linebacker Nick Bonaconti. Now there was only two minutes remaining in this first championship game ever for Pittsburgh, and the Steelers could only watch helplessly as Miami and Mercury Morris attempted to run out the clock on the ground. Leaving the dejected Steeler defense strewn in his wake, Mercury put on a great show for a reluctant audience in the town where he was born. But on the Pittsburgh nine-yard line, on a fourth and one do-or-die situation with only 48 seconds remaining in the game, the Steeler defense rose up to stop Larry Zonka short of the first down. With 30 seconds remaining, the Pittsburgh Steelers would have one more chance to produce another miracle in Three Rivers Stadium. It was not to be as Miami linebacker Mike Colon intercepted Bradshaw's poorly thrown pass to end the game. But as Pittsburgh's beaten, battered quarterback trudged off the field for the last time this season, the Steeler fans applauded. Brown nearly lost the ball. He just got to the 30. And he's met by Manny Fernandez, who had a tremendous charge that time. And Bill Stanfield, 84. Beautiful job. Three-man rush. Head Dilmer setting up the screen to Brown. Brown gets to the 30, and he's pinned in there, 57 on him, and Bob Matheson, 53. Also Bonacani. Miami from there, 39. Trips down to get up field on his turn over the 45, goes to the 47, and he's close to that first down. Jack Pardee brought him down. No team has three running backs like the Dolphins. Here's Greasy on the shorty to Warfield. He's out there, and he's got it. And he's ridden out of bounds at the 33-yard line. Third and four. 
Greasy to the corner to Quilly. He's got him. Quilly. Touchdown. Kurt, I don't know, some people may think that over the course of this season, we've had a tendency to talk a bit about number 81. But I'll tell you, I love to have him on my side in the clutch. Howard Twilling. Well, here's a man that every year they say he'll be cut from the squad. Every year he comes back. He's only 5'10". He's slow, but he has super hands, and he makes great catches. He beats Fisher on that one. He turned him inside out. Did that with one second remaining in the first period. They ran for three and kicked for eight. There's Twilly. The three-man rush. Summer down the middle. Overshoots his mouth. Jake Scott has the ball. Scott to the 50. And Scott who intercepted five passes this year. He's brought down by Terry Hermeling. Wide receiver right in place of Howard Twilley. Sanka breaking the tackle. Has a first down. That's what he does. So strong at 239. So bruising. And I'll tell you what broke the play. A great block by Bob Kuchenberg on another Notre Damer, Myron Patios. Now watch the middle linebacker, 66. There comes Kuchenberg. Great block. And there comes Zonka. You know, George Allen said if he had to change the name of foot fullback, he would call it Zonka. Gilmer's quick flip. Intercepted. Bonacani at the 50. 45-40. Bonacani. Out of bounds. Oh, they're great. Uh, pass coverage. The linebacker's dropping. That's the second pass they've intercepted. And he dropped back, as you'll see on the rerun, just perfectly. Runnage is in the pass rusher. Greasy throwing to Mandich. He's got it. A diving grab by the former Michigan All-American in Jim Mandich. Just in his third year. Another of the young Dolphin players getting better and better. Let's see this again, Kurt. Absolutely great quarterbacking, perfect ball. Don't do the obvious. What a catch by man. Crucial for the Dolphins. And that's kick. He scores. Saka was blocking. So was Larry Little and Norm Evans. And Norm Evans, to me, one of the fine offensive tackles in football, number 73 downs in the first half and had another one call back. And George Allen and his Redskins are going to have to do some deep thinking and some adjusting at halftime. And he's wrapped up. Manny Fernandez again in on him. But we're still within fairly decent field goal range. Tonka behind him. But remorse with the ball. Cutting to the 20, gets it out to the 23 yard line. And he's brought down there by Chris Hamburger. Leading 14 to nothing. Four and a half to go. There's a delay. Coming through with Sanka. And he has a first down for the Dolphins to the Miami 34. Rosie Taylor, the veteran safety man, brought him down. See in this third quarter when they've had the ball, which hasn't been much. Another big hole open. Going through with Sanka, the 40. 30, just belted one man out of the way, and that is one of the longest runs Larry Sanka I've ever seen him make. Right, Kurt, we mentioned earlier, you may stop them outside, but when you've got Morris and Zonka in there, it is tough. This is a brilliant one-man effort. Now watch this violent attack right there. Hard line, 5.20 to go. 14 to nothing Miami. Gilmer again. And this one intercepted. Coming out with the ball is Scott. That's his second interception. He's at the 30, the 40. And they just nail him. Or he would have gone about 105 yards for a touchdown. Charlie Haraway saved of around a 105 yard touchdown interception return. First down now, the Dolphins on the Washington 48, a 55-yard interception return by Scott. Sanka inside, barrels over the 45, and falls forward to the Washington 40. Yeah. 
Kicked again. And he goes over the Redskin 35 to their 34. If it's a tie, we'll have a sudden victory overtime. First team of scores wins. They're the victor. He passes to Warfield, and Warfield stays He's out of bounds. Steps out of bounds on the 30. Sanka's the leading ball carrier in the game with 112 yards. Steelers had a last shot against the Oakland Raiders. Fourth down. And that's the ball game. Then Herter and Stanfield wrap him up. Stanfield 84. They hug each other, smack each other. The two ends, young ends. Stanfield in his fourth year. Then Herter in his second year. And, and Garrow, your premium, Kurt, has got to be the happiest man <laughs> in the stadium. Skin. Now the clock. There's a gun. And Miami has won Super Bowl seven. The final score. Miami 14 and Washington 7. George Allen gave the Redskins their greatest year in 30 years by Joe Thomas. Most of these players were there when Shula arrived. The nucleus was there. But for the Miami Dolphins, the Super Bowl was an entire season in one game. They were not about to lose it. Bob Greasy hit on six of six passes in the first half and threw to Howard Twilley for the game's first score. The rest of the Super Bowl served as a showcase for the Dolphins' variety of talents. The Dolphin defense was the real story of this game, stopping Larry Brown Cole. Jake Scott was named most valuable player for his two interceptions. And Manny Fernandez had the kind of a day a defensive lineman dreams about, as the no-name defense completely controlled the game. So playing an almost perfect football game in a perfect season, the Miami Dolphins were world champions. Only seven years since Joe Robbie was granted a franchise in the old AFL, Miami not only won the Super Bowl, but had gone an entire season undefeated. A feat no other NFL team in history has accomplished. It is unlikely ever to happen again.